дорогие друзья, коллеги, dear friends, uh, colleagues, I especially welcome our international guests. I would like to greet all of you at the Gaida Forum. It's a privilege for us that you are all attending today, and uh, I hope and I'll do my best. I'll, I promise that in the upcoming three days we'll have interesting debates. I'd like to start with a very interesting mission. We received the greetings from the President of the Russian Federation. The remarks I'll read it out to the guests of the Gaida Forum. Dear friends, I welcome all of you that are assembling these days for the Eighth Gaida Forum. Your meetings are always quite fruitful and substantive with high-profile participants, prominent uh, scholars, uh, international community representatives and business community, as well as academics. You uh, look into how to improve the business climate in this country and enhance the competitiveness of our economy. It's of significance that your initiatives and the potential of the forum are unlocked in practice. I hope that the um, recommendations and guidelines elaborated by you will help solve and resolve the goals of the uh, so socioeconomic development of our country and will help overcome global challenges. I wish you every success and all the best, President Putin. I'd like to thank our President for the remarks and let me start, let me kick start the discussion. Well, the inauguration is passed, and le let me uh, further speak from my seat, because uh, we have inaugurated the forum. Distinguished colleagues, the topic of today's session, the plenary session, and all of our forum, is the Russia and the world setting and, and selecting priorities. We are at a purification point now selecting the post-crisis world development priorities. And today in the morning we had uh, debates on the sustainable economic growth and we'll have several sessions to this effect further on. And this is a universal agenda for advanced economies and uh, emerging markets as well and for everybody that went through the global downturn in 08 and 09 and for those who are now uh, looking away out of the current uh, crisis. We have a very interesting panel today. I will briefly introduce all of them and further on we will proceed. We'll, we will not have any um, written reports delivered, though we will have uh, the final remarks. I uh, grouped and arranged the structure of some of the uh, questions. Some of them are known to the participants, others will be a surprise. So we have a brilliant panel today, experts and pundits from around the globe. And let me go one by one. Martin Wolf, probably the most renowned economic observer from the Financial Times. Their permanent commentator and the, the most uh, read economic journalist in the world. Then comes Kevin Michael Rudd, an investigator, a politician, now heading an, a task force of G20, and he served two times as Australian Prime Minister. Well, I'm not moving as per the order, but anyway, Mark Belka, the a brilliant Polish economist that used to be uh, Poland's Prime Minister and President of the National Bank of Poland till last year. Then comes David Lipton, first Deputy Managing Director from the IMF, investigating into economies in transition, dealing a lot with the Russian Federation, and David and I got acquainted back in 1992 when himself and Jeffrey Sachs uh, called me to participate as a discussant in their article on Russia's economy that was in transition. It was September 1992, which was my first visit to the United States. And then comes Paul Pullman, global CEO of Unilever and a partner of our forum, a member of the National Board of Trustees of the Academy. So these are the panelists. And we begin our discussion today. I would at the outset start with a question for everybody. 
we will go question by question first, and then I'll, I'll address people on the panel individually, asking thematic questions. And uh, I'd like to ask our colleagues to assess the main risks and challenges that the global economies or the regional national economy, economies will face in the upcoming three to five years. Uh, in particular, what uh, among global trends causes your utmost concern or optimism, if any? And uh, what is the uh, relationship between the optimism and the downbeat feeling for the uh, upcoming three to five years? So this would be the first question. And let, let's start with David Lipton. Pleasure to be here, and uh, being here, uh, of course, reminds me of uh, Igor Gaidar, who is a, a great economist and a great leader, and I'm so pleased that uh, this forum uh, is in his honor. Um, as we look at the uh, global economy today, we see uh, the global economy improving. Our forecast for next year is... Uh, 3.4% uh, up from 3.1 last year and then to 3.6% and uh, this strengthening, uh, this is a projection that we made last October, this strengthening is uh, largely coming from uh, recovery in the emerging market world. Uh, but now of course we see some strengthening in uh, Europe and the United States. The European economy is, while still um, uh, growing at a low rate is gathering some strength and we presume although we don't know that much about what the incoming administration will do we presume as the markets do that there'll be some uh, uh, degree of stimulus coming from the policies of, of the new administration uh, that said there's really still a cloud of uncertainty that comes from political and geopolitical events and I would say that our view about the near future, about the coming couple of years, uh, remains a very uncertain one. Um, and I'll, I'll say a couple of words about uh, that. I think it comes in some measure from the uh, deep links between uh, uh, politics and economics. And at, at, at the, in, the, in the times in which we live, we've seen a rise in um, populist sentiment, uh, concerns about globalization of trade, concerns about migration, uh, changing public attitudes uh, leading to uh, some changes in leadership and threatening changes in leadership in other places. And how this will play out is, is a major uncertainty uh, for the uh, medium, for, for the coming year, uh, but as well uh, for the medium term. Uh, as far as the, uh, the U.S. Uh, is concerned, you know, we uh, really don't know what kinds of uh, effects U.S. policy will have because we uh, won't see what U.S. policy will be until the administration is in place. Uh, um, as I said, we are presuming that there's some uh, stimulative effect that comes from the announced uh, intentions for some tax reductions and some spending increases. That's a kind of a macroeconomic uh, assessment. What we really don't know is how to assess other possible policies that may come from the U.S. And there, there's been talk of deregulation, talk of tax system reform, talk of policies to boost certain sectors, and talk of trade measures that could be zero-sum or possibly negative-sum. And until one sees whether those, that range of what you might think of as micro-policies uh, affects uh, business sentiment affects uncertainty, affects country outcomes. It's very hard to know uh, what we're looking at. So I'd say that the uh, one to two year economic horizon has perhaps more uncertainty to it than uh, uh, for some time. When you look further forward, uh, I think the, the, while there are still some uh, countries that have uh, not fully in employed resources, and so there's need for some uh, supportive macroeconomic policies. By far the most important thing is for the world to be trying to reverse the slowdown in potential growth that both advanced economies and emerging market countries 
have seen in recent years. And uh, that's, not, that's something that I think applies here in Russia as well as across advanced and emerging market countries. Uh, this will be an age of um, rapid technological change, whether we're talking about digital, uh, information technology, uh, nanotechnology, uh, various other innovations. Uh, how and when those technologies can be turned into uh, increases in productivity, uh, which would translate uh, eventually to rising living standards, how that comes about, that's the major challenge. We've, uh, as an institution, of course, always uh, focus both on macro structural or macro uh, demand support where, where that's appropriate. But I think we really need to all be switching attention to thinking about the kinds of structural reforms, the kinds of infrastructure spending, the kinds of uh, promotion of uh, the development and adoption of technology uh, that will allow for sustained uh, boosts in growth uh, across uh, all of our economies. Let me stop with those comments. Thank you very much. I want to tell all of you that in the upcoming two days we'll have several sessions on the interaction be on the relationship between technologies and growth because there are very many interesting questions and pitfalls and traps of uh, to which extent the technology can rise, raise the living standards and uh, whether the growth will be reduced. Like if we buy an e-reader between, uh, instead of uh, a um, paperback, is going to be a reduction in GDP. Martin Wolf, could you continue on the same, uh, elaborate on the same issue of risks and prospects? Um, I'm very honored to be here and really quite astonished as a journalist to be on the panel. This is not in the audience. Um, I also had the immense pleasure of meeting Yuro Gaida in the early 90s several times. I used to visit Russia quite often. There are some people in the audience who will remember this to find out what was happening. Um, I was immeasurably impressed by his intellect, determination, and courage in tackling the simply stupendous tasks he faced. Um, I should say that it is now 20 years or more since I've been to Moscow, and it was quite an experience coming in yesterday to see what it looked like. Um, I should also say, because it perhaps uh, has a certain symmetry in a way, um, that my very first visit to this city was in the summer of 1990 for the first and very last Financial Times survey of the Soviet Union. Um, so, in answer to your question, I think it's an incredibly clever question because five years is an almost impossible period to talk about. It's, uh, it's too long for you to, to rely simply on simple linear projection of what's going on right now because we know for five years that's not how the way of the world works. Usually it doesn't work for six months, but it certainly doesn't work for five years. But it's too short to go in for woolly platitudes about the fourth industrial revolution, uh, um, uh, the second half of the chessboard and all that nonsense. So it's, uh, it's very tough and um, the way I'm going to do it is to focus on, I think, things which you can reasonably regard as medium term, um, uh, which is somewhere in between. So the first point is, as where we are now, I agree completely with David, it is clear that not only is the world economy strengthening a bit, that more important, that is rather widely shared. Most economies that matter are now growing. Uh, there isn't a region which is in terrible trouble um, and everything from that point of view looks really remarkably healthy. The worries we had about China haven't proved correct so far. The Eurozone is broadly recovering, not everywhere, not to the right degree. The US economy actually has been looking rather strong. Um, the, the commodity exporters have gone through their crisis. So the, the, the economy looks fine, or at least better. Not perfect, 
but better. Um, and that leaves one to the second point, which is, of course, the core of the uncertainty, which is, um, uh, I've been reminded of uh, a famous remark by the great Rudy Dornbusch that when uh, things are unsustainable, they uh, go on for much longer than you think, and when they change, they change much faster than you can imagine. And it seems to me that that's been true of politics as well of now. It's been true of politics. So um, the political consequences of the crisis have turned out to be much more, they, they were obviously very deep, the shock was very deep, and yet nothing happened. Uh, somehow politics went on as if nothing really big had happened. And now suddenly it's happened. And so we are now in a completely different political environment in the developed West. And that I think is the most important risk factor for the next several years because it threatens a possible regime change, a fundamental transformation of the global order. So to me, the point three, that means that the, the principal questions of the next five years was whether a fundamentally cooperative global economic system, a fundamentally open rules-governed global economic system, and a fundamentally stable global geopolitical order, by which I mean order among the great powers, can be sustained. Uh, if it can, I think we can go through this period reasonably satisfactorily, and if it can't, we're in a completely different world. And I think the completely different world possibility should not be ignored. While we don't know what Mr. Trump's administration will do, we don't know what Brexit will mean for the European Union, we don't know what will happen in the next French presidential election, the possible shifts in the environment are immense. Um, and I don't think it's limited only to our part of the world. I think the uh, future development of China is also quite interesting. I'll make just one final uh, point on policy in the West, beyond those central points, which is I've always been fascinated at how politics reacts to economic events. And one of the consequences is that major policies are so insanely pro-cyclical. So we clearly needed a much larger fiscal boost than we did get, in particularly in, in the US and Europe, in the uh, immediate aftermath of the crisis, in my view. And now, particularly in the US, when they should actually be tightening, they are proposing a massive loosening. I mean, it is a massively mistimed, and I think it'll create great problems in, with the dollar, with Fed monetary policy divergence. <coughs> and the same, I think, is going to happen, and I think David discussed it, it's my last point, on financial regulation, which is that after probably over-tightening financial regulation after the crisis, now that the mood is returning to greater confidence, just at this time, it seems likely that we will have a massive loosening of financial regulation perfectly designed to create the great financial crisis of 2025. Um, so that's another medium-term concern I have, pro-cyclical policy. Thank you very much. You mentioned Martin Yermut Dormus. It is indeed one of the most prominent economists of the 20th century. He wrote a lot about Russia, he studied, but apart from the quote which Martin mentioned, I learned from that economist the second law of economic forecasts, and it states as follows, crisis happens after we forecasted, but earlier than we anticipated. Martin. Oh. Marek, please. Okay. Let's first thank, uh, join me in thanking my colleagues uh, for inviting me to this forum. Uh, it's not for the first time I'm here and I'm happy to return and join the discussions uh, on the GAIDA forum. Uh, it's very difficult to say anything revealing after these two powerful statements so I will have to find a niche in uh, what uh, they uh, 
already covered. First, uh, the main problems, the three main problems of the global economy in the last uh, decades are, number one, uh, structural geographical shifts in the global economy, the rise of China, demise of uh, uh, Europe, relative demise of, uh, of the US, which has uh, direct and indirect consequences for, for the relative prices, for the markets. Uh, we have all gone through it and with some delay, with some lag, it produces uh, uh, important negative social consequences in America, Trump, in, uh, in uh, Europe, um, all kinds of uh, populist waves. Second is uh, technologi technological change, especially what concerns uh, uh, information technology. And I will, I will pick out one thing. It's a big uh, difference between how financial markets operate and the rest of the uh, global economy operates. Uh, financial markets operate uh, online due to technological possibilities, which has a powerful destabilizing effect on the global economy. Number three is the slowdown in growth, which happened in the last, say, eight, ten years. I'm not going to dwell into whether it's uh, 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 structural slowdown or balanced recession. Uh, I think what is important is that we improve balance sheets, both uh, on the level of households and on the level of uh, uh, national economies. Uh, on this background, what I see uh, the, the sources of optimism, concern and pessimism in the next uh, few years. Well, as a former central bank governor, I would start with monetary policy uh, and the question of so-called normalization of monetary policy. Uh, you cannot find a, a central banker who, at least in private, uh, longs for monetary policy uh, becoming again a traditional conventional policy. But how to uh, transit from what we have now until, uh, to the, to the uh, state of affairs that we all wish, at least in the central banking community. Well, basically what has happened in, in the Fed is the, beginning of, is the beginning of the process. It's the welcoming beginning of the process. The only problem is how this proceeds further, whether it has a an orderly, internationally uh, coordinated uh, character, or is it more spontaneous as the effect of, uh, of the possible change in the American uh, fiscal policy? If it goes too far, uh, too, too fast, uh, then at least in the European Union we are going to have major problems. Second, well, this is concern. Uh, what we see and what both David and Martin uh, mentioned is that the global economy is improving somewhat and the driver both in the US and, the, and in Europe is the improving balance sheets of the households mainly. And if this continues, uh, especially it may continue with, uh, with the uh, rebound of inflation, which you all long for. I know that the Russians have a different view than this, but we are fed up with stagnation, at least in Poland. So if this continues, this may be a, a, a good, uh, uh, let's say, driver of uh, continuation of moderate growth. So this is a source of optimism. Then uh, there is uh, a concern. Uh, destabilizing of trade relations in the world, which uh, we can fear 
looking at what uh, the president-elect of the United States uh, uh, says. Uh, some things that he uh, pronounces uh, I cannot understand. For example, uh, he has won the election on this so-called anti-Chinese ticket. Uh, at the same time, he promised to, re to revoke the, uh, uh, the Trans-Pacific uh, trade agreement on the first day of his office which basically is what the Chinese would love to happen because this creates a vacuum. The US withdrawing, China stepping in. Well, if this produces some disorderly process, this is the reason for concern, for my concern also. And the last thing is of course, from my Polonocentric point of view, is the future of EU and the future of Europe. And here I'm mostly concerned with one beautiful country in the south of Europe, Italy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now I'd like to ask Paul Palman to share his views. He represents one of the most prominent, one of the greatest companies of the world do fear something or you know it's going to be fine regardless of what the economic policy is like and uh, obviously uh, after renowned journalist and economist it's a little difficult to talk the economic numbers but I'll uh, try to make my point a little bit in a different sense uh, Desmond Tutu was asked uh, when we were in New York uh, a few weeks ago are you optimistic or are you pessimistic? And his answer was, I'm a prisoner of hope. And I think that captures it very well where we are today. We should all be prisoners of hope. The negative thoughts of where this all could lead to where we are, I don't think when you follow that path lead to anything. And the real question is, do we have enough energy and willpower to change the course and drive it into a positive direction? And very much the answer of what the future will look like is, in my opinion, a question of how we decide to behave. And the risk is a little bit, with the previous discussions and other things, is that we're sort of in the eye of a storm where everything is fine, but that we're not really addressing the fundamental underlying issues. Uh, last Monday, we were talking with the senior members of the European Union, and it's very clear that it is a continuous short-term battle of moving from one crisis to the other and, and really an absence of addressing the longer-term structural issues which we know we have to address. So glass half full, glass half empty to me and we've certainly done very well creating prosperity for a lot more people than ever before. We've also done well having a few people benefit much more than anybody else before. And. Uh, but there are some worrying signs to me. The global economy is really uh, growing far too slow than we need to lift more people out of poverty and to accommodate the growth in the world population. In fact, since the crisis of 2007, 2008, we've probably put in 70 or 80 trillion more into the global economy. And whilst many rightfully will argue that it might have avoided an even worse scenario, you would also agree that it hasn't given us much growth. Uh, globalization is reversing. There's enormous geopolitical tensions, uh, and, and some of the panel members have talked about that. Uh, climate change is here. Some people say, well, it's not for the next two or three years. We don't have that much longer, and every year we wait, more people are going to suffer. We see the effects every day, including in Russia, of the changing weather patterns, the natural disasters the water shortages, and some people would argue increasingly. So uh, geopolitical conflicts, issues of migration, and many other things. In fact, the costs to society now, I believe, is already higher than what it would cost us to attack the issues. And then I think one of the more fundamental challenges is that we have a absence of, of shared values uh, that is very clear with the populism and nationalism that is creeping in in many places in the world. 
we tend to focus on some of the big countries because we read the newspapers or speak the languages, but it's happening in many places in the world to an extent that we probably haven't seen uh, for the last uh, 50, 60 or, or 70 years. So this is going to be a very volatile world and it's going to be a world that's very difficult to navigate. The average tenure of a CEO, as I talk for the private sector, has dropped to well below five years because I think they're simply not equipped. The average length of a publicly traded company in the US has now dropped to about 17 years. So we're clearly not really responding here. And there, by the way, the number of public companies is about half the level of what it was 25 years ago. So this is not an economy that is built to to last in that sense. And I think the main challenges are because some forces are coming together at the same time that have never gotten come together at the same time. Kisha Mububani wrote this book, The New Asian Hemisphere. Uh, Marek was already referring to that. The world has moved on, but the global governance hasn't moved on. The second thing is that our consumption pattern or the way we grow our economy has been very good to us, but it has been a linear consumption or linear production model of digging things out of the earth, making things and ditching it into landfills or oceans. And it's come to a stop because we simply don't have too much more to dig or we're finding more plastic in the oceans than fish or we're affecting the climate change so much that it is undoubtedly entered into anybody's business models. So this is a, requires a different economic model next to a different governance model. And then last but not least, I would also say uh, there is a, a financial system that has been developed, especially over the last decades, that is truly decoupled from the global economy. The, the global assets in this world are now about $300 trillion. The real economy is only $100 trillion. Anybody tells me we need these markets of derivatives and all these things to help the poor farmers, but not all of us are farmers, nor do we need to help be helped three times. It just doesn't make sense. If I read that U.S. financial institutions combined, only 15% of their activities is lending in the real economy, if you would call the real economy what we are doing, that's a frightening prospect. And then the last thing is, uh, if we like it or not, it is uh, technology where we see the positive sides of technology that we need to stimulate, but are we doing enough to handle the negative sides of technology? I, although the world is becoming more global, we're isolating ourselves much more around the news that is being fed to us. Uh, we tend to go more to our computers and telephones than talk to each other. It's quite normal in many restaurants in the world now to look at any table when you're eating there and see couples sitting there talking to each other through the telephone. I think they communicate with WhatsApp and have forgotten the, the real language of humanity. And technology uh, also obviously has given consumers a different voice with which politicians, I think, struggle. Within all of this, if I simplify it, then the biggest things I'm worried about is the growing level of inequality. The 1% in the world that now has the same wealth as the 99 percent, the issues of climate change, the technology issues where there will be faster than people think an enormous wave of job destruction and more f financial exclusion instead of inclusion, and then last but not least moral leadership. Now in all of this what makes you optimistic? I think there are a few things that make me optimistic. First one is that even people that might not have as strong of a moral compass the cost of not acting is becoming higher than the cost of acting. And that's a good thing if many people still live in a world where you're only driven by the P&L of a balance sheet. The second reason I'm optimistic is that we have a new generation coming in of millennials especially that are more morally driven. You see it in their purchase behavior, you see it in their choice sets, you see it in their priorities. The third reason I'm in, in optimistic is in fact the internet and the positive sides of the internet. Trust is broken. Next week we'll be in Davos and Edelman will issue its, first, its uh, next trust barometer and you'll see again that it's incredibly low. Low for governments, low for business, even lower for CEOs. And yes, not surprisingly, the lower is now for the press and, and the news channels. And the only way that we can restore that trust is with transparency, 
that builds that trust that we need for long-term prosperity. And uh, I think the internet has given us that opportunity. It's not a week or not a day goes by that Martin's newspaper publishes a company on the front page that frankly caught caught with their pants down. And I think that transparency ultimately will drive behavior. And then last but not least, I'm optimistic because I do see increasingly partnerships emerging where people understand based on the work that has been done on the sustainable development goals or the climate change COP21 in Paris that we cannot solve these issues anymore alone, nor can we sit here and blame someone else. We're all in this together. You might speak Russian, I might speak Dutch, some others might speak other languages, but ultimately we are one. And if we don't start to behave for the common good and work together in a different way than we've done before, we won't solve these issues. And these partnerships across private sector, across civil society, with governments, etc., are increasingly there. So if we can focus on those around the Sustainable Development Goals, scale them up, I do think we can create a brighter future for all. But that decision is all in our hands individually and collectively. Thank you. You know, I'd like to turn to Kevin Michael Rudd right now, and I'd like to broaden the question. And apart from talking just about optimism and pessimism, the priorities and the challenges, I'd like to clarify one thing. I'd like to touch upon the topic as a follow-up to what has been said just now. The special characteristic of our era is the conflict between the global markets where money can be transferred if you press the button, where there is no global regulation. Is it a real problem? Do you really think so? At the beginning of the global crisis, back in 2008, 2009, the G20 set the task of becoming the instrument for global regulation. How realistic was that goal? How and can it be achieved? What are your views in this regard? Much, Vladimir, and it's good to be back here in Russia and good to be back here in Moscow and see so many friends. Uh, Vice Premier Shivalov, my old friend uh, President uh, Helen of Finland and many others. Um, I'm taken by what Paul Pullman said before about Desmond Tutu and us all needing to be prisoners of hope. <coughs> Uh, if I was answering the first question which you set for us, Vladimir, before you then just changed it to the one that I'm about to ask, answer, uh, based on myself being also a prisoner of hope, I cannot but conclude that for the next five years we are looking uh, at much more of a set of downside risks than we are looking at upside opportunities. And I say that as objectively as I can. The management of geopolitical risk. I am deeply concerned about the trajectory of uh, US-China relations. Uh, I'm concerned also about the ability of national institutions to respond to the impulses towards turning inwards and the ability to strike a new social contract domestically which will arrest that possibility. Um, I worry also about the question you just posed, which is the adequacy of our global institutions, which I'll now turn to. Uh, the G20, which I was privileged to be a co-founder of with uh, Prime Minister Medvedev when he was president of the Russian Federation, uh, together with other colleagues, um, was formed in a crisis. Uh, president Bush, I think, correctly decided at the time uh, that to respond to an existential threat to the global economy, uh, we needed to broaden our institutional response between beyond the classic Western European club. And he was right. It was quite a strategic call. And now you have an institution with 20 members, five from Europe, five from Asia, um, and you have um, five from the rest of the world, and of course you have uh, the great economies as well. That's much more representative. But there's a quantum of global production, there's a quantum of global trade and international economic activity. There is a, te there's a tendency today in this uh, complex world in which we find ourselves
to simply say, well, we tried that in the year 2008 and it hasn't worked. Let me argue the counter case. <clears throat> Number one, it succeeded in causing a financial crisis from turning into a global recession and becoming a global depression. That was the active risk at the time. And in the face of this existential economic threat, we actually decided to collaborate. It was a policy and political choice to collaborate. We could equally have concluded not to. But there's nothing like sitting around a table with 20 heads of governments, each of whom are staring into their existential futures, both personally and nationally, uh, to work out that collaboration was the only solution to the crisis at the time. So roll the clock on um, seven or eight years. What is the commonly perceived sense of crisis and is the institution able to handle it? Let me answer that in just three ways. Uh, number one, we should not just happily skip over the agenda for which it was initially created, which was deep global financial regulatory reform in order to reduce, while well, it's impossible to eliminate, the risk of a repeat financial crisis of such a systemic nature. A huge amount of work has been done through the agency of the Financial Stability Board. A huge amount of work has been done through uh, the Basel uh, Committee. Uh, and this work is uh, ultimately accountable to the G20 itself. This is a good development, but the work has not been complete. And if I'm pointing to risk again, the emergence of real estate bubbles, the emergence of other asset bubbles, look where global equity prices are standing at the moment against, frankly, uh, the delivery of um, returns on investment. Quite apart from new emerging interesting and creative asset bubbles, including what's arising in China and elsewhere out of digital finance. I think uh, this regulatory agenda on finance, too big to fail, capital adequacy ratios, our ability to respond rapidly and effectively, is not a completed task. But at least we have an agreed machinery now to do that. In 2008, we had to invent it within about a month. The second point about the future of institutions such as the G20 is this. Whereas it may have succeeded on its first task, which was to prevent the financial crisis turning into a economic depression, on the second task set for it, which is to create an environment for long-term, sustainable, balanced global economic growth, after more than half a decade of what could be politely described as suboptimal growth, um, but in fact what others have described as a low growth trap from which we have at best a fragile recovery in the last 12 months. This task remains ahead of us and confronting it head on is the explosion of the new protectionism which is a classic anti-growth agenda. Uh, we also have not identified or effectively funded uh, the potential new driver of global economic activity, which is the global infrastructure deficit across the world. Chinese investment in One Belt, One Road, I think is useful. Um, notwithstanding what Martin just said before about counter-cyclical or pro-cyclical economics, Trump's agenda domestically in terms of US infrastructure may be helpful. But on this uh, engineering of the sustainable growth model, given the debt overhang, given the fact that monetary policy instruments are exhausted, and given, therefore, that we are looking at new positive drivers for the growth agenda in rebuilding global trade and promoting a global agenda for infrastructure investment, that is where the core task now stands. And the final point I'll make about the G20's future agenda is this, and it was never part of its original agenda, but given we are looking at such a profound change in the structure of the global order more generally, the geopolitical order, the geoeconomic order, etc., there has come a time where you need a mechanism which can deal with these questions of high politics at a point of transition in the order. And this, therefore, is a brand new agenda. When we face such deep questions as geopolitical uncertainty, uh, US-Russia, will the Trump expectation be in fact too great in terms of a normalization of this relationship? And will it in fact lead in different directions? US-China I've alluded to. 
uh, and of course the internals of Europe itself way beyond Britain but the future of the rest of the European Union and then the overall dynamics of globalization and counter-globalization. Um, on the management of this, what I describe as much wider geopolitical risk agenda, I think there is a new emerging requirement for the G20 to perform. And I conclude with this, Vladimir. While we may be experiencing a uh, fragile recovery just at the moment, if you look at what the annual reports, um, I think um, by the World Bank, maybe it's by the OECD, not in the IMF report, uh, about the, uh, the Global Uncertainty Index, it stands now at the highest it's been since the turn of the century, aggregating all these factors together. Therefore, institutional arrangements capable of managing down risk in all of its category areas is critical if we're to have sustainable balanced growth for the future. Thank you very much. Right now, I'd like to get down to the next questions. These questions are going to be individually tailored. In view of what has been said, there is now a need to assess the efficiency of anti-crisis policies. I'd like to ask this question, and I'd like to give it to Martin Wolf. This is a very complicated matter. We talk a lot about the measures that have helped us prevent a recession, but they have not stimulated the growth. There are many economists who say that anti-crisis policies such as fiscal stimulus and money stimulus of the recent years have helped inefficient economies survive. In other words, these policies have prevented what has been called by Schumpeter a constructive destruction. So we now have stability without no growth in Japan for the last two and a half decades, and the Europe, European countries, the developed countries are facing this issue. At the same time, there is another matter, and Martin Wolf has written about it a lot. Right now, money has piled up and the world which cannot be turned into investment. If you look at the statistics, you'll see that savings in all the developed countries are more than investment by several percentage points. Aren't these two matters correlated? Weren't we too efficient in preventing the demise of inefficient enterprises? Weren't we too good in preventing this growth from happening, Martin? I'd like to ask this question of you. Thank you. I have no idea where this question is leading. Um, the, uh, okay, I'd like to write a book about this. Actually, I have. Um, so the, the short answer is the position you put forward, I have described perhaps a little unfairly, as liquidationism, um, uh, following the famous uh, reported views of Mellon, the Treasury Secretary in the early 30s. And it is, if only we allowed every company in difficulty and every bank in difficulty during a financial crisis to collapse, after everything has collapsed, including, of course, the political and economic systems, we can then resuscitate it after the subsequent world war. I don't regard that as sensible economic policy. I regard it as insane. Now, it's a perfectly reasonable policy for Estonia or any small country that does not have to rely ultimately on its own demand. But it is not a sensible policy for the world. And once the crisis becomes a crisis of the entire developed world, we are talking about the world. So it seemed to me absolutely clear that the first order of business during the crisis, in order to avoid the consequences that I have just described, which I believe are what would have happened if we pursued liquidationism, was to sustain demand as best we could. And that required both fiscal and monetary policy action. And as Kevin rightly said, that was done and successfully, and it short-circuited a process of recession which in the first year or so fully matched that of the Great Depression. It short-circuited and reversed it. 
and it was clearly the right thing to do. Allowing all the banks to collapse, allowing vast number of businesses to disappear and be restructured would have, in my view, been a social, economic and political catastrophe for which the, um, the responsible authorities were right, the responsible authorities were right to avoid. I believe in addition that subsequently from 2010 onwards, the decision to withdraw fiscal policy support and particularly to slash public investment in many countries was both in the short term and the long term profoundly mistaken because it was obvious that the post-crisis recession would be long and the post-crisis malaise in demand would be long and therefore that fiscal support would be needed. Throwing everything on monetary policy has, in my view, created quite significant imbalances to which you refer. And there's no doubt that I think the monetary authorities were right to do what they did, but it would have been far better if fiscal and monetary policy had been coordinated more effectively from an exemplary point of view uh, for longer and that the fiscal tightening finally occurred once recovery was well underway. Now, of course, in the US, recovery is reasonably well under the way. So having a huge net fiscal stimulus, which is quite different from increasing public sector investment, which makes sense, uh, strikes me as essentially mad and incredibly ill-timed. However, and here I would like to, so that's my view on the macro policy and avoiding a complete collapse of the financial sector and the large parts of the corporate sector. There were other policies that were needed and on, which policy, and on which policy makers didn't focus. I think we could have been much quicker and more effective in restructuring balance sheets, particularly the balance sheets of the financial sector, also of, to a lesser degree of households, and particularly in Europe, where this process is not yet complete even now. And the US was far more effective than the Europeans in sorting out its banking sector quickly, and that was incredibly important. Second, we needed to look very carefully at structural obstacles to growth. Far too much attention was being played on the pace, pay, uh, placed on the labor market as the principal structural problem. I think this is a mistake. They, there were very significant structural problems, impediments to growth in a large number of economies, notably uh, some of the crisis hit countries in the Eurozone and action taken to focus on that, productivity enhancing and so forth, was clearly necessary and appropriate, and many governments did the reverse. They took actions which actually made it more difficult for long-term growth to start. But to put it at its crudest, I don't believe for a moment that the subsequent relatively weak growth of productivity, very normal, uh, consequence of financial crises, by the way, though not universal, is fundamentally the result of the decision to avoid a Great Depression. The decision to avoid a Great Depression was right, both politically and economically. The policy mix was imperfect. The microeconomic elements were certainly imperfect, but the fundamental decision to do what was done was, in my view, unquestionably right. And I think we are unbelievably lucky that the people who were in charge at the time, and I should rem remind you that it was a Republican administration at first and then a Democratic administration that pursued these policies, were absolutely right to do so, and the alternative would have been grotesquely irresponsible. Thank you. I'd just like uh, to ask Marek Belka to comment upon the very same question, but in the, in the following perspective. Poland used to be the only EU country in the first stage of crisis in 2009 without no negative GDP parameters, GDP indicators, unlike the rest of Europe. The Polish economy demonstrated sustainability and stability, but Correct me if I'm wrong, Poland never used active stimulus because it was uh, clinging to quite prudent financial and fiscal policies. What is your assessment of the anti-crisis policies, bearing in mind the Polish experience of the past seven years? I will disappoint you to some, to some extent. <coughs> 
um, it's true. Poland used to have a very sound uh, macroeconomic policy throughout uh, the whole period of 20 years. Uh, taking into account that it is a small country, a small uh, currency on the periphery of a big country, a big periphery, which is the Eurozone. And in such a situation, a country has to behave uh, in a cautious way, making uh, provisions for rainy days, avoiding heroic deeds, and this is exactly what we did. Number two, uh, we were lucky not to have developed an overgrown banking system. Uh, it's small, it's extremely well capitalized, uh, which is the reflection of the fact that the country and the society is not heavily indebted. Uh, some people uh, point to the fact that uh, having an independent uh, national currency helped. It might, have, it might have helped. And if we isolate an, an episode, uh, 2008 and 9, we could uh, share this opinion. And this is basically an opinion that I have um, basically proliferated throughout the world uh, all the time. I'm not sure I was right. Uh, I think uh, if a country has a sound macroeconomic policy, sound fundamentals, it can easily share common currency with Germany, because this is what everything boils down to. Uh, so I think it was not unhelpful, but it really didn't change the, the picture. But there is one additional factor that everybody overlooks, even the guys at the IMF when I came in 2008 there, nobody paid attention to this. Well, Poland um, had a major fiscal stimulus implemented in the year 2006 and 7, which is economically insane, politically motivated, but somehow we were lucky because two years later the crisis struck and it started working. So, to avoid a crisis, you have to lead a cautious policy and have luck. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I believe Poland did uh, fiscal populism prior to the period when it was needed and uh, you've been successful, you've been lucky, fortunately. And David uh, Lipton, probably you should provide a macroeconomic comment as an IMF uh, expert. But uh, will you please speak more specifically about the trends of the anti-crisis policies? There are expectations that the inflation, uh, high inflation risk may be quite prominent because the central bank is pumping, central banks pump economies with money. So should we expect upsurge in inflation or the long-term stagnation or both or not? What is your view? Last question from a slightly different angle. You know, uh, Kevin Rudd pointed out that the G20 came in and stopped the crisis and kept it from becoming uh, a global uh, depression. But the G20 also set out to do other things, to try to make sure it couldn't happen again, and that meant trying to reform banking sector regulation to prevent a recurrence of the kind of abuses that led to the problems in the United States and in Europe, and to pledge not to have protectionism, and in and of itself to be the, f the premier forum for economic policy making, a cooperative process. And I think all of those are important and give us crisis fighting lessons because now what do we see? We see uh, rising populism, 
concerns about uh, the globalization of trade, concerns about migration. And I think one of, we perhaps have learned the lesson that along the way we should have paid more attention to the negatives or the downsides of, the, of globalization and of the policies we faced. But for us at the IMF, as an international institution, there really is the risk that the whole process of uh, cooperation, the process of uh, integrating and uh, trying to have mutual gain uh, could be wound down or could be impaired. And uh, you know, our institution's mandate is to promote growth through international cooperation. The G20 is the political forum in which that happens. So I think that uh, it's a very important lesson of crisis to, in fact, shift ground a little now and to not only promote growth but to be very careful to be thinking about how to manage the negatives, the downsides uh, that come from it. Because otherwise we'll see this uh, destructive process, we potentially could see this destructive process of the end of cooperation. Vladimir, I mentioned, you mentioned earlier that um, we first met uh, at, at a conference uh, many, a long time ago. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you, uh, at, on that occasion, told the story, uh, which dated from that era, of an academician who asked another academician, is there a risk of World War III? And the second academician said, there's absolutely no risk, but the pursuit of peace will surely destroy everything. And we have to be sure that uh, we don't allow that to happen. Thank you. In Russian version, it was like uh, whether the Third World War would occur. There will be none. But the struggle for world will obliterate everything, eliminate, annihilate everything. Oh, Kevin. Can I ask you to provide your comment on that, on that scenario, on that topic? The, uh, I'm more cautious than that. Uh, let me... Uh... No, Australia далеко, а она спасена. Well, Australia is, uh, is very far. You'll see, be able to save yourselves. That's why uh, many Australians have taken out visas to travel to New Zealand. It's even further. Um, <laughs> Uh, let me go back to the subject at hand, and uh, I'll build on what uh, uh, my friend David Lipton had to say before. And I'm going to make some very short, sharp remarks about what the G20 should do in the future. It was no easy decision by the United States and by other countries back in 2008 to create this institution. Secondly, if you read its mandate, it was conceived by the member states who represent 80 to 90 percent of global GDP. Uh, that is, to, it was to be the principal international body of uh, economic governance. Thirdly, it's performed its function well in crisis mode. Fourthly, it has performed less well since the crisis, the immediate crisis, dissipated. So there's a very practical question which arises now. I think there's a grave danger as the G20 moves from country to country each year. It follows what I think is a slightly idiotic European tradition, which is everybody's got to have a theme. Um, for God's sake, it reminds me of all the conferences I go to in Southeast Asia, where we all got to have a different shirt um, for, and a different costume for every conference that we go to each year. Uh, it is patently absurd. No, it wasn't an Australian idea, David Lipton. It came from our friends in Southeast Asia. And uh, I'll pay you back for that later on. <laughs> it was President Bush who asked me to wear a Stetson, remember. The, um, so forget themes. This is a serious subject. The sustained institutional management of the global economy. Therefore, um, it needs a continuing agenda, and this is my first sort of somewhat unpopular proposal, it needs a continuing secretariat. It should not be located in a particular capital, it should move where whoever is hosting the G20 in a given year. But it needs a rolling high-level institutional memory and a, whole level, a rolling high-level uh, institutional agenda and a capacity to give it effect. 
My other thought is this. Uh, given that the G20 will be hosted in Germany this year uh, under Chancellor Merkel, uh, the world now cries out for a leading global champion of global free trade, as everything else is rolling in the other direction at the moment. And anyone who thinks that this won't be at an economic cost to each of the economies represented in this room is deluding themselves. Trade has been the vehicle through which we have added to our national and global wealth, and its distributional impact within our economies has been significant, although imperfect, and requiring domestic policy measures to close the inequality gap. But if ever there was a need for a chairperson of the G20 this year to take on the mantle of saying that uh, protectionism will kill us all, as it threatened to do in the 1930s, uh, it is now. Chancellor Merkel has that challenge before us and she should seize it with both hands. Failing that, what I fear is that with the mood of protectionism, capital P, small p, not even necessarily using tariffs, not even necessarily using subsidies, but in fact deploying a whole series of other uh, non-tariff barriers to trade, that we begin to embrace the smoot hawley tariff by stealth over time and slowly strangle global economic growth as a consequence. Trade, in its contribution to global GDP, has been net negative for how many years now, David? Three, four? Um, so as a consequence, we have a real problem. This is new. The prosperity we had in the 20, 25 years or so after um, 1990 has in fact begun to evaporate, and this has been one of the principal vehicles. So I go back to the fact that the G20 was an institution we created to deal with the crisis, to ensure there would be another, not a repeat of that crisis coming out of the financial sector, a formidable mandate in itself. But in prosecuting sustained and balanced global economic growth, it needs strong leadership, a continuing agenda, a permanent secretariat, albeit one that moves from capital to capital. And I say that as having been with Prime Minister Medvedev, one of its co-founders and uh, one of its supporters ever since. Thank you so much. As we have started talking globalization and integration and disintegration, a uh, problem, most salient in, example of disintegration is the Brexit problem, the Brexit issue. Britain is quite far away from here, but us being here, we can't but memorize the collapse of the USSR, which was probably much more painful than in the British case. But anyway, I'd like to ask Martin Wolf. Probably it's a major disintegration development since the collapse of the USSR. Was it it's going to be quite profound, this cleft? And there was a Soviet joke mentioned, and I'll tell you another joke. Uh, the question was whether communism is dangerous, and the answer was no, Co communism was not dangerous, but the, the building, the construction of communism was dangerous. So Britain without the EU is dangerous, or the exit process is dangerous per se, which, uh, which has more uh, inherent danger in itself. So, thank you for that I'm going to do something a little naughty, but very, very quick because you, you, uh, a couple of questions were left out there which I think really need to be answered. Um, so, uh, and it will be 30 seconds. Um, did the central bank's policy lead inevitably to inflation? The, um, there was a great debate between Milton Friedman and the Austrians on the handling of precisely this issue. And Milton Friedman said, that it is insane to allow the money supply to collapse in a crisis and that's what the Austrians wanted and Milton Friedman was right. So that's the position I took during the crisis very clearly and explicitly and in a position when credit growth was negative, I repeat, credit growth was negative in many countries, the money that was needed to maintain the money supply had to come from the government, i.e. the central bank. Is that inflationary? Unambiguously, no. It's the avoidance of deflation. 
and, the, and that's what was indeed achieved, they did avoid deflation. Is it manageable once credit, private credit growth um, expands to withdraw this support? Of course it's manageable. Will it be managed? That's a completely different question. So it was, I don't think this is at all problematic. And the second thing that's been left out said there, which is I think very, very important, is the issue that Paul Pullman raised about pessimism versus optimism. Now, as a commentator and analyst, I think I'm fully entitled to be pessimistic. I don't have any uh, vested interest in changing the world to that for somebody else. But I don't think you can be sensibly optimistic if you don't start off by being realistic. And the realistic truth is we're in a terrible mess and it's getting worse. And this is obvious geopolitically and geoeconomically in structural ways that have been discussed in the panel. And that leads perfectly to the total idiocy of Brexit. Uh, the British decision to do something insanely stupid which was in completely unnecessary. The referendum was unnecessary. The whole thing is amateur hour to a quite extraordinary degree. And I used to think the UK was a moderately mature democratic society. Well, I will never have that view again. The question then you have asked is how severe will the consequences be? And I will only make, I think, two points. One, it seems to me now unambiguously clear, and I've just written this for a column that will appear tomorrow, that we will end up two years after we start this process, in, which will be in a couple of months, with what is called hard Brexit. And what do I mean by hard Brexit? It's either hard or ultra hard. Hard Brexit is an agreed exit. We have agreed the exit, but we have in all probability no longer a membership of the single market and almost certainly no membership of the customs union and probably, almost certainly, I think highly probably, no free trade agreement either because none of those things can be negotiated in the time available given the preconditions of our government which are that we must have control of immigration, it's not politically possible to avoid it and we must be outside the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice. These are conditions put forward by the Prime Minister. I don't think she can reverse them. I don't think her party would allow them to be reversed. And given the position of other members, that means that the least bad option is hard. So what could be worse than what I've just described? Well, the worst well, what we described is that we don't even agree an exit agreement, so we leave the EU without actually having any agreement on anything. That's quite possible. So what is confronted is a fairly impressive mess. And, that, uh, and something very big would have to change that. Now, the, the second question on this that I wanted to address is how bad would that be? Um, I don't think it's quite like the breakup of the Soviet Union because there are still markets and lots of market relationships will continue. That applies to finance and other things. The disruption to trade arrangements, though real, is not stupendous because we would end up with WTO tariffs, and WTO tariffs with one another are generally low. Um, the f wholesale financial markets will largely remain integrated. It's very difficult to disintegrate them without having exchange controls. I don't think either side would do that. We will continue to have marketed currencies. So there will be trade disruption but it will be manageable. I think the costs in the short run will be significant, but manageable in the long run. I think the major cost for the UK will be that the economy will end up permanently somewhat more closed than it would otherwise be, and we'll have far less skilled immigration, almost certainly. But those are political guesses about the future. To me, and this is the very final concluding point, the biggest cost of this disaster is that it will weaken the stability of the structure of Europe, uh, the creation of the European Union and Britain's involvement, in my view, I suspect this is not universally shared in this hall, is an unambiguous and colossal boon for the Europe and the world. Uh, and the disintegration process, which might now be beginning, though I say only might, it might actually strengthen Europe, could be incredibly damaging 
for the stability of Europe and therefore also for the stability of, uh, of the world. Um, we, many countries, including Britain and I think occasionally Russia, find the European Union really, really annoying. I would insist they will find its disappearance orders of magnitude more annoying. Thank you so much. My question to Paul Pullman. Well, by and large, Unilever is a global company, after all. Whether you are sensitive to integration processes and developments, or disintegration, whether it tells on you, or is, are these neutral developments for you? And my second question, the second part of my question, what, what are your prospects in the Russian Federation, your investments, your possi development possibilities in Russia? Please, the floor is yours. On a macro level, if you run a company like ours, which is uh, in 190 countries, having about 2 billion consumers a day, 7 out of 10 households, and being one of the largest consumer goods companies in the world, then obviously um, you have to think about your business models at the same time as you create a vision of where you think the world is going. And being able to operate in a more volatile world, or as some people call FUCA world, volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous, requires a different model than we probably had five or ten years ago, and it certainly is true for every uh, company. Um, more purpose-driven would be one thing. Very hard to predict the crises. We talked about this famous black swan, when one or another thing happened that we didn't foresee, but there are black swans now every six months or 12 months. So having a clear purpose with an organization of our magnitude, which is 175,000 people, allows our people to take decisions without rules and regulations that might stifle our innovation capabilities. We spend a lot of time on that. We have to make our organizations more agile, increasingly so, uh, the speed of change is exponential in any market, uh, technology being part of it, but all the other factors, we've talked about it as well. So you have to think about building agility in your organization. And then you have to think about, at the same time as you build agility, you have to build resilience. In this world, companies need to have more financial resilience, people resilience, and many of the other things. So how you do that is an important part. And then, last but not least, we spend a lot of time on uh, leadership and what is this new leadership that we need to have uh, in 2020 onwards and that would be a separate discussion but more purpose driven for sure, systemic thinkers, better able to work in partnership, uh, all these things are, are things that companies need to think about. As far as Russia is concerned, it's a little bit bringing it closer to home. Uh, you know, our company has been around hundreds of years and we plan to be around hundreds of years and uh, there's no reason why we shouldn't be in Russia either. It's a 140 million market. Eurasia is, is well positioned there with six markets. Um, there's an enormous opportunity still to develop these markets and bring better lives to people, which is what we tend to think uh, we're doing. And uh, the fundamentals are basically sound. And as you've been around for hundreds of years, you have gone through wars in different countries, through hyperinflations, through different forms of governments all over the world. Right now you deal with a problem in Zimbabwe or a problem in Venezuela or a challenge of hyperinflation that Argentina came out of. And the challenges that you have in Russia are minuscule compared to many others that we deal with. And uh, we found that the best solution is to be there long term. Work actively, your value chain, invest in people, be sure that you have a business model that is agile, that can react to things when they happen without any doubt. But companies that make the long-term commitment and that stay are companies that are doing well. Uh, the Prime Minister talked about avoiding the negative agenda of populism and short-term solutions and focusing on the positive agenda of long-term structural reforms and as part of uh, FIAC, 
the uh, foreign investor advisory council here with most of the foreign companies we're actually finding that uh, you have here a system of responsiveness to putting in these longer term structural changes to ensure that the economy goes in the right direction that is positive you want it to be open you want it to be competitive you want it to be uh, equally export driven as you change your economy from an oil dependency to broaden that and uh, I think you're doing that in a smart way where you give everybody at least in most of the industries uh, an equal chance to do that so I'm fairly optimistic and certainly uh, Russia for us is a uh, at, at this point in time a healthy market we've invested over the last few years about three billion euros in in Russia and we've been able to associate ourselves with quite some attractive brands like uh, Imarco ice cream uh, so if the debate here gets too hot there are cabinets around the building I noticed uh, help yourself to an ice cream to cool off uh, we bought the Kalina business uh, which is a very fine business on uh, personal care uh, Baltimore and uh, not to forget that as we celebrate here today uh, our 25 years actually in Russia when we started as an original company in uh, buying a company in St. Petersburg the Severnoye uh, Sayinji uh, company in cosmetics and frequencies and in fact when we opened that company 25 years ago it was actually signed by your current president who at that time had another responsibility and uh, that has not uh, been in fame. We've uh, been able to... I'm afraid I have to cut you short, Paul, because right now we are going to welcome the chairman of the Russian government, Mr. Dmitry Medvedev. Mr. Medvedev, we are concluding our discussion. I'm going to be glad to listen to it. I've got two questions left, which I'd like to ask. I'd like to give the floor to Kevin. Australia is a very far away country, and yet it's a model of a country whose economic success is based on great natural resources. But Australia is free from the so-called resource curse. Australia has a very innovative economy, so given what Paul has said, that they're going to work in Russia, they find it comfortable here, could you share with us Australia's lessons with regards to this resource-based economy? One of the worst things you can do is come to another country and tell them what to do in their own country. So I don't intend to do that. The beginning of wisdom is to understand uh, the differences between countries. And uh, Australia is vastly different to Russia. We're 25 million people, you're 140 million people. We're uh, an Asia-Pacific country. Uh, this is a Eurasian country. We have vastly different histories. But a few observations about how Australia has come through, and we're just about to enter our 25th year of consecutive economic growth without going into recession. And Vladimir, by the way, it's not just the Poles who came through the crisis without going to recession. Uh, we managed to do that as well. Um, two or three points. On the commodities question, as we know, it is uh, a blessing and a curse. Um, until 1985, in Australia's economic history, uh, we were in danger of becoming a closed commodity-based economy until our then Prime Minister stood up one day and said, if you want this country to just turn into another banana republic, then you're welcome. Otherwise, we need to fundamentally change. And then began a process of 30 years of structural economic reform where the economy was systematically internationalized. It is now probably one of the three or four most open economies in the world in terms of trade, investment, market access, etc. This has been a very painful process on the way through. But it was a deliberate national political decision around which a consensus was formed uh, and led to a whole series of um, 
of policy changes, both in terms of protection levels, but also in terms of opening up the domestic market as well and deregulating the labour market. On the, I say this uh, cautiously given that Paul Pullman is next to me, but the Dutch disease, as economists would describe it, um, and uh, didn't come out of the, uh, the world poppy boom of the 17th century, but basically out of the, the gas discoveries of uh, the 20th century, has always been a very large looming factor in the minds of Australian policymakers because it is so easy to sit back and simply ride the commodity wave. The policies you need to embrace against that therefore need to be active, strong and decisive because the impact of the Dutch disease is very simple. If you're running a strong commodity-based economy, if your currency is convertible, which ours has been for a long, long time, decades and decades, uh, then the currency um, uh, value appreciates considerably. It therefore creates a disincentive for exports from the rest of the economy. Secondly, it creates a massive diversion of domestic capital in the direction of the resources or commodity sector and away from the other productive sectors of the economy. So this is a permanent uh, message in the mind of uh, the Australian policy leadership. The second overall point I'd make is therefore we've had to take policy decisions to effectively support the emergence of new major uh, growth drivers in the economy. The major one we have succeeded with there is in the financial services sector. We did it through policy measures uh, for which I can claim no credit at all because they were done before I was elected as Prime Minister. Uh, what our the government at the time did was introduce um, a mandatory savings policy for every Australian citizen. Uh, we called it the National Superannuation Scheme, uh, whereby every single person was required to effectively save the equivalent of 9% of their income each year. The government supported this with beneficial taxation measures, but the consequence of it is that we developed a massive domestic funds management industry of several trillion dollars as it now stands, it now having been in operation for 25 years. Uh, a Russian audience would not know it, but the Australian funds management industry is probably the fourth largest in the world. Um, and that is a consequence of deliberate national policy. It has caused our financial services sector to look out and not just in, and it is a major generator of economic activity within the Australian economy. Which brings me to my third point in terms of dealing with economies as vulnerable as certain eco commodity economies are concerned, is dealing with uh, the, the uh, challenges which come with dealing with an ageing population and social security obligations which we all face. A mandatory national savings policy means that most Australians now have their own retirement income policies funded by this mandatory savings process. You don't have to put it into a government fund, in fact it's all run by and large by private funds. We've also increased the retirement age to 67, 68, which uh, I did in, in office. Not terribly politically popular, but frankly in terms of taking the pressure off expenditures was really important as well. The final thing I'd say, Vladimir, in our case, which I think is what's worked, is that for the better part of um, 70 years now, we in Australia have run a very open migration policy to keep the country young. Uh, even today, a population of 25 million, we would run probably about 200,000 migrants into the country every year through a structured program. Keeps the country young, and that's critical in terms of dealing with a simple dependency on commodity-based um, commodity uh, exports as well. Um, and those, I think, are the enduring experiences we've had in carving out our economic future. My final point, that may be relevant to our Russian friends, given I was with uh, President Putin at the Vladivostok uh, summit uh, toward the end of last year, I think in last September from memory. For us, after the British, who have come in for a lot of criticism today, justifiably in my view, over Brexit, and when the British decided to join the European Union back in the early 1970s, it caused Australia to conclude that we had no reasonable access in the future to European markets. 
it was a reasonable conclusion. We then began a 40-year-plus policy of comprehensive economic engagement with Asia, patient economic diplomacy, sustained engagement with every Asian institution. Now 70% of our exports go to the region, by which we mean the Asia-Pacific region. None of these things have happened for us overnight. No single government can claim any credit or responsibility for the passes and the fails. But it's been those core reforms, I think, which have helped us over that period of time. Thank you. Mr. Medvedev, if you'll allow me, I'll sum up. And then there's going to be a short comment. We've talked about the five-year-to-come challenges. I was asking about the balance between optimism and pessimism. So what are the feelings? They are mixed. Some say the glass is half full, others half empty. We have talked about the issues you will be cause of to a certain extent because we talked about the global governance, the regulation, we talked about the G20 Israel as the global regulator, we have also talked about the contradictory outcomes of the anti-crisis policies that have been pursued over the recent years. We, we were asking the question whether these policies have been successful or not, we have also talked about the country experience. Unilever has promised to invest actively in Russia as a global company. And right now I'd like to give the floor to David Lipton. He is going to share his outlook for the world economy and for the Russian economy. My question is whether and the future Russia is going to ask the IMF for money, and David said, certainly not. So please share your outlook, David. Well, Vladimir, uh, Kevin Rudd said that the, the worst thing is to come to a country and tell them what to do. Worse yet is to come to a country and tell them what to do on the same stage as the Prime Minister. <laughs> um, look, uh, I spoke a little earlier about the global setting uh, everyone here knows that Russia has just had a very tough decade with global financial crisis, the oil price decline, and sanctions. And I think the, I'll say this, in the presence of, of uh, key policymakers uh, sitting here in the front row, I think the country owes an incredible debt of gratitude to the policymakers here who maintained very sensible uh, stabilization policies throughout and spared Russia the kind of instability that might have made this last decade a debacle rather than just a difficult one. And by that I mean that the public finances were uh, kept in order despite very substantial pressures from the loss of energy-related revenues. The exchange rate was made flexible. Uh, inflation was kept under control on, with the understanding from past experiences that uh, letting inflation uh, and inflation finance go rampant would be a disaster and where uh, there were problems in banks, bank closures have gone ahead despite the difficult circumstances. You know, that said, the bottom line uh, of all of this uh, difficulty was that uh, it was a difficult time for growth, growth in income, growth in consumption. Uh, the economy is essentially the same size today as it was in 2007. The convergence that the economy had been experiencing prior to the global financial crisis has been interrupted. In those previous seven years, 2000 to 2007, the Russian GDP per capita went from 37% of European, of Eurozone GDP per capita to 63. That was an incredible progress, perhaps boosted as it was by uh, the uh, run-up in energy prices in the middle of that period, um, but uh, impressive nonetheless. Consumption in real terms rose by over 10% per year during that period. Um, now that's been interrupted. The question is what happens in the future? Uh, the economy as we sit here and, uh, today has turned from 
recession to uh, a restoration of growth. I think most forecasters, us included, see growth uh, in the near future. But that said, when we project for five years and look forward to uh, Russian growth resuming at about 1.5%, which is what we think is uh, likely with present uh, policy trajectory, that's about the same rate of growth we project for the Eurozone. So this means for the medium term, no further, no resumption of convergence. So to me, the question arises, what can Russia do? What should Russia do to uh, restore uh, more rapid growth, to uh, start uh, a process of uh, convergence again that will be uh, uh, satisfying for uh, across the uh, entire uh, population. Now, many, m much has been said about this. I don't uh, promise uh, novelty. There's been here an, an, an important and an active policy discussion about diversification, about modernization. I think to a large extent there's agreement on a number of the ingredients that are uh, necessary for uh, that process. Some has been uh, done, but even where there's agreement, uh, there are many steps uh, in the areas of establishing clear property rights, uh, doing judicial reform, dealing with uh, corruption issues. There are, there's certainly, uh, let's say, an unfinished agenda, despite the fact that there's a lot of agreement. I think, though, that for Russia to really uh, make uh, strides towards a more rapid growth, there, there's one area I would like to put on the table as warranting more attention and more uh, discussion, where I think there isn't agreement, and hence where discussion would be, uh, would be uh, important. This is a world, this next uh, five to ten years, as I said earlier, will be a world of uh, technological change. We're on the eve of a, just a huge technological revolution. And uh, if uh, Russia, this will be as, as big a deal as the Industrial Re Revolution. Uh, and if Russia is to capitalize on this, uh, it's going to have to find a way to take advantage of this new technological revolution. Russia, for the most part, was left behind in the Industrial Revolution. And I think most scholars believe that an important aspect of that was that during the 19th century, there was a reluctance to allow the free chartering of limited liability corporations, something that would have allowed the mobilization of capital and capitalizing on the, um, uh, the, the uh, innovations and developments that drove the Industrial Revolution in uh, uh, the Western European countries and in the United States. Um, I think that the, the, the fundamental question is analogous today. I believe that the very large footprint of the state in the economy uh, is uh, worthy of discussion. I think it's an impediment to the agility, the uh, technological innovation and adaptation uh, to the establishment of, of a really uh, the kind of competition that you'll need uh, in the future. Uh, it's very hard to... Uh, now, the Russian state certainly is active in promoting growth and development in important ways here at this university, uh, uh, a university of impressive size and quality. Uh, in the many uh, institutes that are pursuing technological uh, advances in Skolkovo with Rusnano and other, other government uh, entities. But at the same time, I think it is hard to imagine. Russia lags behind in, its, in many metrics in the private sector, whether it's the formation of companies, the size of the, the, the number of small and medium enterprises, the export uh, ability of, uh, of private companies, um, the export, the non-energy exports of the country today aren't really higher than, uh, than in 2007. Um, I think that it is hard to expect private businessmen to invest all of their time and energy, their life's work, uh, investing in research and development if they fear that they will never reap the profits of all of that uh, action. So I think it's worth thinking about not just the size of the footprint of the state, but the fact that it has fuzzy edges and it's never uh, entirely clear uh, if you're in the private sector whether you're going to be left on your own. So I, I think this is a subject that's complex. 
Uh, there's no simple, I, I can't offer a, a simple economic proof that uh, a more, uh, that uh, uh, a more free private sector will be the engine of growth of the next couple of decades. I believe that, that, that it's the case. I think it's worthy of a lot of discussion. And I doubt that, um, for those of you who, uh, pardon the expression, <coughs> want to make Russia great again, I, I doubt that it can be achieved without a more vibrant and a more free uh, private sector. Thank you. I'd like to clarify. David Lipton used the key slogan of David Trump's electoral campaign to make America great again. That's what David said. Thank you very much. Before I give the floor to the chairman of the Russian government, I have this honor every once in a year. So before I do that, let me say that these issues that have been raised today are going to be discussed and the coming two days we're going to have a large round table on the Silk Road. We'll talk about the Brexit issue, the globalization in the short term to mid term term. We are also going to talk with Mr. Shivalov about competition as a political and geopolitical matter. So stay with us for the coming days. And Mr. Medvedev, thank you very much for joining us. Let me give the floor to you. First and foremost, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, I'd like you to accept my thanks for the invitation to address the Gaida Forum. Right now we've got this tradition established. The government opens every year not with some boring discussion, but also with participating in the Gaida Forum. Traditionally, Moscow serves as a platform for the leading Russian and world experts and pundits to talk about the acutest challenges and risks the global economy and separate regions and countries are facing. That's what we've been witnessing today. Let me share with you my views just in brief. This is not some program, some manifesto. I'm not going to analyze what we are to do in the country and the region. Last year I did the same. I also published an article. I provided some profound analysis, but I do not think I have the right right now to bore you with lengthy speeches after one and a half hour of discussions that would be wrong of me. Besides, so much interesting is happening in the world right now. We see some flamboyant politicians amusing the audience in other countries. I think it's hard to translate into English. Anyway, I do not think I'm entitled to bore you with lengthy speeches, as I said. I think each and every country has problems, has peculiarities of their own, and separate answers have to be found to these challenges, and we should avoid any tyranny of experts who are trying to adjust the economic policies of very different countries to their universal generic recipes. At the same time, given the difference between the economic status of Russia and other countries, we cannot but agree on the shared issues we have before us. That's what my colleagues have just mentioned. And in these changing conditions, the economy and economists are searching for opportunities for sustainable development, for new priorities and new decisions. In this sense, everything we are doing is closely intertwined to the global economic agenda. Despite the specific character of the current situation Russia has found itself in, it's evident that there is one shared issue we are facing, and it has been evoked today. That is the risk of long-term stagnation. It is now clear that we cannot restore the normal growth rate only thanks to monetary or fiscal policies. We require structural reforms. We've been talking about that for the last 15 years. And yet, despite 
all the countries' peculiarities, these priorities are almost identical. I refer in particular to the development of the human capital, thanks to education and health care. I refer to improving the business climate and to the development of our infrastructure. Russia, let me say that, has emerged from the crisis better off than was forecast. But this does not mean that all problems are behind us, because the normal status of each and every economy is growing at the rate of its potential. But most experts agree that the potential growth for our economy is 3.54% a year, so the question is how we can put it into practice. As you know, the government is drafting a plan to spur the economic growth so that in the near future we might be able to reach a growth rate higher than the average growth rate, which is probably not going to be too much, so there's something, there's something viable, something achievable. In Russia, we've got to reform our economy where the commodity sector is dominating. Certainly, the economy right now is vulnerable because the commodity prices are at a low level, so all decisions related to structural reforms are going to be made very cautiously in a balanced manner. They're going to be accompanied by the required stabilizing and supporting measures. We're going to tread very cautiously. Yes, we are going to take caution. Quite some time ago, we agreed not to do anything to the taxation system yet. At the end of the year, the President and myself were both said that the progressive scale of uh, income tax for the physical persons was not on our agenda, and yet some colleagues and the government said that the government was discussing that matter. No, we are not talking about that. We are talking about something different. We have designated 11 priorities for the coming years. The project-based approach, which we are implementing actively in the government governance, allows us to distribute resources more efficiently and to pursue these avenues. I will remind you that these are projects for life, such as improving health care, education, improving the utilities, the urban environment, and addressing environmental issues. There are also projects for growth, such as building houses, supporting exports, raising the labor efficiencies, improving the small and medium enterprises, spurring the entrepreneurial initiatives, improving the supervision, developing transportation infrastructure, helping single industry cities. All that needs to stimulate economy and our business activity. And this is very close to the agendas of many developed countries of the world. There are certain constraints which have to be overcome so that we can achieve an acceptable growth rate. They are well known to many developed and developing countries. I refer in particular to the deficit of investment as well as to the protracted paralysis of lending. At the same time, we've got to upgrade the technologies and training. That is what we need. And by the way, I believe that the technological lagging behind risk for this country is one of the most formidable challenges that we've been facing. Probably one of the most serious problems that we've been facing I mean our economy and definitely we should talk that and make relevant decisions we also need to develop competition and reduce the excessive regulation of the economy by the government we should raise investment appeal of our regions and definitely we should uh, reconfigure, restructure the public government's governance system an important peculiarity of today's economy economics by and large that refers to everybody is well the ever growingly politicized nature of today's international relations the hardline approach sanctions that run counter always run counter to economic considerations I'm not talking about the political motives but about the fact that these are detrimental 
to the economy. Politically motivated barriers to mutually advantageous projects keep generating tensions globally, worldwide. I'm not referring to specifically this country. I'm referring to all of the world, but there is a different trend in the global economy that is witnessed, and I believe it's fundamental and a long-term one. We can see that the commodity markets and huge whole sectors are becoming more integrated and mutually dependent, and that knits together the global economy and helps us unlock the opportunities of the new technological wave, which is called Industrial Revolution 4.0, that provides a clear-cut answer to us. The global nature of the economy will get more and more pronounced in the course of time, and definitely there will be the ensuing growth in competition. So globalization should not be saved. Just the politicians should not put handicaps on it and it'll be it'll manage by itself using interalia global governance mechanisms that have been mentioned today including these new frameworks as G20 and others and G20 uh, well is the continuing format of the G8 or G7 now G7 without other major economies means almost nothing. The Russian Federation in its, uh, in its turn will not turn inwards. We're not going to ignore global trends. Our goal is to use them for the most maximum benefit of ours. And Li Huan Yu once said that a country in reforms, in the process of reforms, should find for its own niche in the global economy. Therefore, we are willing to participate in global trade more actively and create our own added value chains and participate in external economic alliances and FTAs more actively. And I'd like to dwell on another topic in particular, not because we are now within the confines of the National Economy and uh, Public Administration Academy, but also because all the experts believe that a shift towards the digital economy that is now witnessed will entail the reconsideration of the role of the government in managing the economy. All the public governance system should be tantamount to the zone of the responsibility, it should be as swift and agile in decision making. And everybody knows that the pace of today's business is quite high, skyrocketing. And such companies as Uber or WhatsApp are able to earn the first billion of dollars for two years only and previously companies spent decades to earn a billion although no one knows whether they have bright future in store for them but the pace has been accelerated considerably so we should assess the scale of the change and these step changes should be taken into account when we reform the public administration system of ours. In other words, for the digital economy, the governmental structures and bodies should be quite complex, state-of-the-art, agile and flexible, which does not mean that we should automatically adopt all the business practices by default. It's not always possible. I don't think that all the ministers or agencies will just be teams of couple of dummies, you know. But we should definitely strive for optimizing our structures. The public sector should also move towards digitalization, which is at a, a high pace now, at a rapid pace now, and we should learn from the leaders. And we have such plans. We have some achievements, although modest ones. I'm referring to online services and public services and public procurement, digital purchases and online education and medicine. And I believe all the topics I have enumerated, as well as many others, will be in the focus of the forum's attention that has just been launched. It all will be on the agenda. Once again, my sincere thanks to all of you.
for attending, for coming to Moscow from different countries and regions. Thank you for coming to share your ideas and I'd like to thank the organizers. I wish you every success and fruitful deliberations, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much, Mr. Prime Minister, and let me confirm that one of the pri priorities that the governmental program spells out, will, well, all of them will have special sessions dedicated to them, as a matter of fact. It's not because they are on your agenda, no, it's because they are relevant for this country and they're conditioned by the real needs and uh, priorities of ours. And today's forum has entitled Russia and the World Setting Priorities, which is of significance. Thank you, Prime Minister.